I'm delighted to be here. This is my second time in Ann Arbor. I've never been. Uh, I was I was telling Joyce and others over the last couple of days that every time I looked up Ann Arbor on the internet or on college guides, it just had this bluish wintry haze. Um, <laughs> you guys have to do a better job at your campus picture, your official campus picture. But it's a wonderful town. I was I was I've had a lot of fun the last two days. Um, this concept of making health is something that we've been working on for a while, and I'm, I'm, I'm just thrilled that more and more people are, are taking it on because we need to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we do and, how, and, and the approach of how we try to democratize uh, med medical technology this morning. Um, a lot of you, uh, and some of you have heard this already, uh, uh, you know, I, I can't really cook. Um, and so I pay attention a lot to how people indeed cook. Um, and one of the things that I like about cooking is that we have actually fully democratized that process. Uh, regardless of your level of expertise, you can, anybody is welcome to do it, uh, and regardless of the outcome, sadly. Uh, <laughs> but we have curated a set of, uh, of instruments, of equipments, of tools uh, that, that, that in any other field would often be scary. Um, you know, we, we go to our kitchen, we have all sorts of things like this. We have a very robust ecosystem of gadgets and technologies and things that allow us to improve the processes, that, uh, to, to grind things, to, to make things different. Um, we, we use tools that, um, you know, our, our EHS reps or safety reps at the labs would shudder um, if we use them anywhere else outside the kitchen. Uh, and sometimes we really get um, carried away by, if you go to Louisiana, this is how they do Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> But the other thing that I like about cooking that I've paid a lot of attention to is um, we've, we've, we've created basically protocols for it. And we fully disseminated these types of into recipes. It, it, and, and a lot of people have access to them. And, and they're not just based on um, a single place and a single level of expertise. You have, they cut across cultures and geographies and people can, can remix them. So, so to me, that, that bodes well for the process of democratizing of, uh, 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 processes and devices and, 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 and creation. Traditional DIY has also been democratized. If you go to Home Depot, it's not just a bunch of Bob Vila's um, that, that hang out there. It's people like me bumbling around trying to find the glue, you know, using the wrong tape for the, but, but, I, but, but, but anybody's allowed to go there. And yes, you have people that know it. You know, you, if, if you go down the plumbing aisle, it's a really interesting, um, uh, uh, I, I, this is what I do in my off time, <laughs> but, 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 but you know, you'll, you go down the plumbing aisle next time to Home Depot and you'll find two types of people. Um, the type of person that goes right into the middle of the aisle and they're, e they're either a plumber or a professional and they know exactly what type of washer and what are the eighths of a diameter or whatever it is and they just, you know, they come out with two little pieces and they're going to go fix their stuff. And there's people like me that for $3 more just buys a whole kit and replaces the entire toilet uh, flushing system that's at the end of the aisle. And so it, it, it we, we've, we've created mechanisms and form factors that cater to both levels of expertise, and there's no, there's no judging. Um, making is something we do throughout our life. We do it at the beginning of life, and we, we do it all the way until we retire. Um, it's, it's really in our DNA. And this is what I'll call making 1.0. It, it's the notion that we just, we, we, as human beings, we're, we're just really um, tooled to do that. Making 2.0 is what happens when people start building things like this in their backyard. And there's a lot of people that build things like this in their backyard. And so the, the technologies, the rapid prototyping, the connections increase. And so we go into ever more advanced uh, technologies. We, we, uh, next door to our lab, there's a lot of people that build these little guys. And, and then they take them to, I think, Pennsylvania. And they do this with them. <laughs> and. Uh, there's other people that, that make scientific instruments in their garage that would otherwise cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Thank you, NSF. Um, and, and, and sometimes we launch things into space. We couldn't, we, we weren't, 50 years ago, we couldn't even dream of doing this um, uh, for, for $10,000. And people are do, launching their own little satellites into space. So um, one of the things that, 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 that we think, think about is what, what happens in healthcare? How do, we, how do we expand that, and why should we expand that? Well, in healthcare, one of the things that, that um, let, me, let me backtrack. We're, the other thing about making 2.0 is that we're not doing it alone. And that's really important, as, as Joyce uh, pointed out. We're actually doing it through communities. Um, 
and whether it's Maker Faire, whether it's uh, the lo your local hacker space or, 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 or a meetup, um, it's become a lot easier to make those connections. And not, it's not just the person getting a lonely subscription from Popular Science or Popular Mechanics and reading how to make a deck in the, in the, in the back pages like my dad used to do. Um, but for medicine, it's one of those areas where, unfortunately, for the last maybe 50 years, 40 years, uh, we've been told, don't do that. Uh, you can launch something into space. You can make um, um, uh, uh, a bunch of scary uh, fire-breathing robots. But in medicine, you'll shoot your eye out. So this led that <laughs> up to the professionals. And I think it's, it's, it, that, that, that's time that we, we have to change. Um, what, what, what happens in, in our work, we started to do a lot of work in the developing world, and what happens when we leave things up to the professionals um, and, and the people that are the traditional experts at making these types of devices and, and, and healthcare technology is that most of the des uh, design is optimized for designing it for, in this case, America. And when you take it, these devices to the developing world, 90% of these devices are, are donated. Six months after, 80 to 60% of these devices fail. And when they fail, they fail catastrophically. So this is a, a typical backyard in a hospital. Uh, this is a, a picture of, uh, of a hospital in Nicaragua uh, that got sent to us a few months ago. And, and, and the thing is, it's, there's, there's this concept of design lock in engineering and design where, where as engineers, we're fascinated with, with, um, with the specs that we've created. And we say, okay, now this is, this is it. Everything goes under. Imagine like when you... If anybody's tried to take one of these apart, it's very hard. You have to get special screwdrivers. All. So, so, so when these things fail, they don't bend. Um, they, they just break. Um, now, what happens when people decide to, 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 to take things into, into their own hands? Um, oftentimes, um, what, it, what we see is that in the, in the cases of extreme healthcare care um, circumstances, there is a lot of ingenuity. This is a man in China, um, and if you can just Google him, uh, who uh, basically made his own dialysis machine um, and lived with that, that's that homemade dialysis machine for six years because he couldn't afford the traditional dialysis at the hospital. Um, he went on the BBC or, or something, and of course, uh, uh, the Chinese government now has a full scholarship on him because they were a little bit embarrassed. Um, <laughs> but, 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 you know, to me, it's like, should you try this at home or should you not? It, 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 and a lot of people say, no, you shouldn't, but I, I think, I think, I think we, 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 we can and we should. This is a nurse, one of our maker nurses in Nicaragua, um, who, who her stethoscope broke. The little plastic thing that goes on top of her stethoscope that looks like a speaker vibrates back and forth, and it broke. She couldn't afford one, so she went around the hospital and, ex and experimented with a bunch of different pieces of plastic, cut them into a, a circle, and settled on overhead transparency slides. Um, the tragedy of it is that she was embarrassed by her hack. Um, she, 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 she thought she wasn't an engineer and she, she was more focused on what it looked like because it, you can tell it's not that pretty. It has a bunch of like bandage tape on it, but it totally worked and that's what did the job. And, and, and you know, we, we, we were trying to explain to her, it's like, no, no, you don't understand. This is a, this is an awesome hack. This is, at MIT, we love this sort of stuff. Um, and they, but she doesn't know that. She doesn't know who we are. She doesn't know what MIT is. Most people think MIT means the Michigan Institute of Technology in Nicaragua. Uh, uh, they, they really do. I was like, I get introduced. It's like, yeah, it's the Michigan Institute of Technology. And so, so, uh, so they just, you know, there's no, yeah, they just, it, like, they just, you know, um, they, they, they know sadly what Harvard is, which breaks my heart every time. Uh, <laughs> So if I need to go and if I need the doors open, I'll fib every once in a while. But anyways, so this is, this is another example. Um, uh, Andreas Grunzig. Um, who's heard of an, uh, balloon angioplasty? Um, this is like something a cardiologist does. This is like a Medicare and reimbursable code. We do these, you know, every day in America. Um, the man on the right is a intervention, was an interventional radiologist from uh, East Germany living in Switzerland. And he was very interested in how could you use catheters, so these types of balloon catheters that would ordinarily be used in the, in, in the limbs and use them in the heart. Um, and he was in Switzerland. Now, this is not a developing country. This is not Nicaragua or China. And Switzerland doesn't have any lack of money or certainly lack of engineers. They have actually a pretty awesome design engineers. But he was simply outside the game. Um, and so he would come home at night. And from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m., he would basically hack, this is his kitchen, and his neighbor, he would basically hack these catheters with his neighbor. 
Maria Plouffe, and you can totally tell it. There's like the kitchen and the pizza magnets and the wine <laughs> bottle, uh, um, and and some random chair. Uh, so so it is not by any stretch of it, even a home lab. This is like literally um, kitchen counter prototyping. And um, he went on to create a, b uh, the first um, balloon angioplasty catheter, got permission to, to try it out on a patient that had otherwise no other choice, presented his work at, 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 in the United States, and then immediately got hired by Emory University to lead that program in the States, and essentially created the field that we now use today. So DIY has, in fact, been with us, not just in developing countries and poor places, but, but in everyday medicine. This is Charles Dodder at uh, Oregon. Um, he would, another interventional radiologist, he would hand make these, um, this is called a hair loop catheter, for instance, and uh, he would use guitar string cables and Volkswagen um, cables. Um, and then he went on to co-found Cook Medical, one of the largest medical device uh, manufacturers today. Um, this is Earl Bach, and a lot of people know about uh, him because he's close here. But he basically founded Medtronic and made the first wearable pacemaker in his brother-in-law's garage. And 60 days later, it was in, 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 in a patient. So I think that we, we, have, um, we have, again, DIY has been with us. And one of the things that we're doing in, uh, today in the lab um, exploring this is looking up how nurses do this. We have a project called Maker Nurse. It's going around the country and finding that, th just like Daniela Urbina in Nicaragua, there's actually a lot of nurses in America. And, and, and for the longest time, they've been making stuff with their hands, something they can, and, 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 and at the beginning of the century, the American General of Nursing basically had like a make magazine um, uh, column for nurses, it was called uh, the Trading Post, and people would like submit prototypes, and 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 we have a compendium of them in the lab that we're analyzing, and something around 1950, 1960, that that those contributions started to wane, and then they just completely stopped. And so we were trying to, f we have some hypotheses on why it stopped, but the reality is that the creativity of those nurses um, was alive then, and actually is still alive today but they've gone stealth on us. And so we're out there trying to find out how do you find them when they actually don't want to be found. Um, so we set up different emerging expedition sites in different hospitals um, uh, under an IRB study to really find them. And what we're trying to do is um, find them, understand what they're making, what type of materials they're using, what are the drivers of what they're making. And then we end up finding people like Tatiana at, at Maimonides in Brooklyn who makes these CPAP adapters uh, for bubble CPAP, and what you can see here is like little hat. This is an oxygen adapter uh, with some tegaderm and, and, and Velcro, and it looks like it's a manufactured device, but what it is, it's actually, this is a sock. This is like a piece of tape, and she just basically fashions everything in a just-in-time manufacturing outfit inside uh, using, you basically hacking that hospital supply closet. Um, <laughs> So we, 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 this is uh, Roxana Reina who makes uh, things for um, uh, omphalocele wounds and other types of wounds and basically she's turned uh, an omphalocele procedure into, from a very early stage surgical um, intervention on babies. This is when um, your um, intestines basically are born outside, you're born with them outside of your abdomen. It's totally treatable but it's a very uh, traumatic uh, surgery for, for the baby. And she basically treats them as a wound and then they just zip them up for cosmetic reasons and she saves the hospitals um, hundreds of thousands of dollars a, uh, a year. Um, so that's, that's, that's maker nurse. Now when we, when, this is after about six to seven years of work in trying to understand how are we mashing up these two worlds that generally are told not to mash up. And there's some challenges. The first challenge is we often run into situations like this when we work in the developing world. And I'm going to New Mexico next week, and it's very much so like this in many cases. Um, there's no system. There's no, and sometimes it's a road like this, a, a literal situation like this, but oftentimes it's a figurative situation like this. And what we find is that certainly people in charge of development and, 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 and sometimes in health, the immediate um, uh, knee-jerk reaction is we need to turn that into this. We need to mature the system and create something so that everybody has the system that, you know, we deserve in Ann Arbor. Or we de Systems are great, but they take a long time to make. Um, when I was growing up in Honduras, uh, there was a hospital system that was being built and uh, in lieu of a, of a failed hotel project. Um, I left Honduras and that, that hospital system never got built. It, it, was, it, was, it was one of those things that, that just 
always impressed me. So what we do at the lab is say, okay, we're going to make the gadgets and to deal with the system as it's been dealt with us. It, it, instead of trying to, to create a new system, we're going to make basically the Land Rover of medical devices. The other challenge is that we're fascinated with technology and, 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 and the notion that technology has to be magical. And Arthur C. Clarke put it really well, where it's uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. My problem with magic is that it's a black box. It's designed for a black box. You don't understand it. It's, it's mysterious. And in medicine, we have a lot of black boxes. Go to your doctor's office, and you'll find they happen to be beige or white or aqua, but they're still black boxes. You don't understand how these instruments work. You're not even invited to understand how these systems work. Um, you get the choice of what housing you, color you want, but not the, you, don't, you don't have an understanding of what's inside. So we do a lot of technology tear, tear downs. We did a little bit of this yesterday uh, with Joyce and her team. And we try to understand what's underneath um, these devices and what is, the, what is the real complexity behind them and what's not. Because that way we can increase our ability to have uh, 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 an intelligent conversation when somebody's trying to sell us a new technology. The social structures are really important. Everybody assumes that he is the innovator and she's sort of like this calming presence for the And sometimes it's quite the other way around. We still have challenges in the regulatory system. It's a very complex uh, procedure. Um, it's not going to go away. But there's other agencies in the government that have pointed an interesting way for, for encouraging DIY innovation. If you look at the FAA, for instance, they have um, an entire agency dedicated to home-built planes that by law have to be built by the user. And they figured it out. So we can do the same thing with the other agencies. I think this is a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. Um, you know, medical industry is not really nice to long tail device needs. If you're the only patient in the state that needs a specific type of device or an orthopedic device, that's now a very tailored and custom device. And, and, and with the rise of both digital fabrication and democratization of all these things, I think we can actually pull, pull these things off. There's this notion that we need really fancy labs to make this happen. And, this, and, 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 uh, and, and one of the things that, that I've become convinced is that that's not always the case. Um, this is a picture of our first lab at MIT. It was a loading dock. Um, and I, we had to share it with this other lab that did like agricultural tools and charcoal testing of all things. But we were building um, uh, these adherence diagnostics for, for tuberculosis. Um, and when we were able to make these things here and get an NIH grant because of, their, because of the fact that they worked, I was like, we could make these things anywhere. Um, now we have a nicer lab. There's, there's a fascination lately with, and, and, I, and I get why, because we don't want to just end up with a lot of vaporware, but, the, but there is a lot of push with, um, with this notion of scale and dissemination. And, 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 and as much as scale and dissemination and making more of the things so that we can get it out there is important, I feel that we have to remember that experimentation and exploration and, and understanding that these things are not just sitting on the shelves of the University of Michigan or MIT or anywhere else. We have to make, we have to, we have to experiment and we have to break things and that's the way you, you innovate. You just, you don't just say, okay, we're going to innovate from three o'clock to four o'clock and it's going to be awesome and then we're going to scale. Uh, it just doesn't work and if you hear people saying that, just, you know, yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't want to go on a rant, I promise Joy. Um, we, we have to encourage a culture of breaking, of building, of solving, of remixing things. That's what we try to, that's what all these people did before us. Um, and, 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 and instead of just having conversations, we encourage our students to, to build things in real time and have conversations through the hardware process. Um, we have to encourage tool spaces and maker spaces and, and creation spaces within the healthcare system, not outside the healthcare system. One of the things that we're working with right now is creating maker spaces in hospitals so that when you press six, you actually go down to the, instead of, you know, instead of trying to assume that you can, the doctor then gets, um, gets connected with somebody. Like what if the doctor has access to that um, tool um, or, or the nurse and, and it becomes part of their culture? 
Um, the other driver that we see is, is yes, the, the, the notion of DIY, because there's a lot of, uh, of excess capacity in makers and DIYers. The, the, the things that they can make are amazing, and if we can just channel some of that energy back to, to health, I think it could lead to a lot of interesting things. We made the first maker space in a hospital a couple of months ago, and it was amazing just to see that convergence happening inside a medical, a medical center in, in Brooklyn. Um, one of the things that, that, that as I mentioned, we, we're creating uh, maker spaces because maker spaces are, have this really interesting um, cultural concept in an institution. They're not like skunk works where you basically take the smartest engineers and designers, lock them up in a room and feed them every once in a while. That's what uh, you know, companies like 3M and CIA and, uh, and, and, and Lockheed do. Um, in a maker space, it's kind of like, like a gym. Um, anybody can use it. Um, and it's a very flat structure, and what that creates is that ability for, say, the receptionist or, 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 or the person that works in accounting or, or a radiologist to just come in and say, and, and try something and make a suggestion that is often naive, but through that na uh, naiveness, I think, comes a lot of creative exploration. Um, I'm gonna skip a few of these. One of the things that we do a lot is, is kits. Um, kits for us are like a gateway to making because what we do is we curate a set of parts that allows people to, to, to get up to speed really, really fast. This is a kit for um, a solar clay, which is a surgical sterilizer, and we specifically made it so that it's modular and anybody can build it. Um, and what you get is basically this device that allows you to have an autoclave simply by shining uh, a set of mirrors that are concentrated onto a source and, and heats it up to WHO standards. Um, we did the Medikit largely in response to people like Daniela. We knew that there were more people like Daniela out there. So how do we help them and not have to depend on when I'm hanging out in Nicaragua? Because frankly, I, I live in Cambridge and I like living in Cambridge and I'm not gonna move to Nicaragua. It gets hot in the summer and it's, you know, all of these different reasons. But I, we still wanna help them. We wanna help them in a sustainable way. So we started to disseminate a lot of these and make these different workshops and create these toolkits for health. One of the things you can make with it, we tried this yesterday, is uh, take a nebulizer, and uh, this is a big problem in, in Central America, for instance, and know that you can make a nebulizer for about 10 bucks in parts using a bicycle pump. And then when we shine a fancy laser through it, we find that it actually mimics the same type of performance as the PAR ELC, which is just the, the, the standard that, that the, the FDA uses. And then those nurses that are usually subject to those social structures that we talked about. Now those nurses are, are teaching the doctor, that's the doctor over there, how to make something. Um, and then when they get comfortable with it, they start to hack it. And so in this case, they're actually making, we tried this yesterday, they, um, they're making a, a, a nebulizer for, for pediatric use that can treat several patients at the same time. This is an example of design language. Uh, what I mean by that is using color coding and shape coding so that people just look at something and then can recreate it by remembering that snapshot. In this case, we'd use it for making diagnostics. Uh, that way people can remember, okay, you use a Romanian flag, that's a combination of glucose and pregnancy tests at the same time to monitor uh, moms to be. Um, this is an evolution of how these things are evolving. This is another type of test used for clinical chemistry. These are microfluidics that you can use um, using things that you can buy from Michaels, just a vinyl cutter for $200 instead of advanced um, um, uh, uh, photolithography. Uh, but if they don't have a computer, which you do need with that machine, you can just use blocks. And, and, and again, trying to, not, try, trying to meet people where they are, not necessarily trying to impose a technology or, 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 or technology literacy. We do what we call a lot of supply chain arbitrage. It's a fancy way of saying we just go and hack stuff and, 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 and recognize that. Um, I was very interested in, in, in technology, trans the velocities of technolo technology transfer across geographies. Why is it that some things travel faster than others in a distribution chain across, across frontiers? I never figured it out. So one of the things that I did explore was I can anticipate why medical devices travel a lot slower than consumer devices. Um, but I can hack the consumer device supply chain to make medical devices. And so we show people how to do that. In this case, a nurse uh, in Nicaragua wanted to make an IV alarm. So he took her to a toy store. This is a person that never had even heard the word design in, in the, in, an hour before and teamed her up with 
the janitor and like the local handyman. Um, and then allowed her to take that, that she, she actually bought a gun, like an AK, a toy AK-47, and, and basically harvested the electronic parts to make a prototype alarm. It, you know, and you can look up the video, it kind of looks like an IED, it doesn't look that pretty, but, <laughs> but I, I dare you to find, you know, engineers that, that whose first prototype is just beautiful. I mean, it just doesn't happen, and that's the way things begin. Um, lastly, one of the kits that, that, that we made recently was an adherence kit. Um, I'll show you an adherence technology that we have right now, but one of the things that we realized is why don't we take a, a, a piece of our own medicine? Um, instead of actually trying to push down a technology that we fall in love with, why don't we, why are, why don't we give the user the option to prescribe their own combination solution? So in this kit, you have a lot of different things, um, and this was actually motivated by, by um, by something that, I, that we're seeing a lot that, that, that keeps us up at night, which is a lot of fancy gadgets that are being pushed onto the marketplace in health. Uh, m the easiest formula is basically gadget and paired with a, with a smartphone, um, and, and then it equals $300. And, and a lot of the people that need these technologies or need these solutions for support simply are not going to be able to afford these things. Um, so we've taken aim at the smart pill bottle recently because smart, 300 smart, three hundred dollar smart pill bottles are not going to help people that have, you know, five prescriptions. They're just not. They're because then what does that mean? Are we going to try to promote a culture that says we need fifteen hundred dollars of financing to track pills? Um, no. So you can make these things for about twenty bucks. Um, and so this has a number of different things. It has a smart pill bottle, it has a smart pill counter. You can color code the pills so that people can recognize them just using, you can do this using like um, cake, sprayable cake icing. You buy it, uh, Michaels. Um, we go to Michaels a lot. Um, uh, you, uh, so anyways, um, this is a device that we initially do, uh, did for, for uh, tracking adherence. Uh, one of the things that we said is, what if we took a standard diagnostic and converted it into, a, into an interface? And, and so we built this back at this lab. Um, we have a, now, a newer one now, but, but, but the, the aim here was tuberculosis. And this is, an this is a case where we address technology to, we use technology to address a system uh, challenge. The challenge here was adherence a lot and for, for TB. TB is a, a disease that you have to take uh, pills for a long time. And, um, and, and, and the WHO approved um, um, system is somebody goes to your home and checks on you and watches you take your pill. People get PhDs on the topic. Um, and, and somebody at MIT did another study find, find, to find out that in some parts of the world, 90% of those people that, that this community healthcare workers, um, they don't show up to work. And so, so the patient just is left hanging and then um, is non-compliant and that sometimes is a, is a is, is, is a, it's not good. It, you, you can then develop multiple drug resistance tuberculosis. Um, a group came to us and said, can we do something about this? And they thought we were going to come up with a technology for the, for the healthcare worker. And, in, in, and being from Honduras, I was a little bit cynical because I thought, man, this, these people are, these are the same people that, you know, people take pictures of in National Geographic and they're the heroes of the village and all this other stuff. But I'm from Honduras, and I could totally see them just simply not giving a damn and just not going out showing to work. People are people, okay, regardless of whether you're, you know, being idolized in National Geographic or not. So we said, okay, how do we, how do we put the patient at the center of this and empower the patient? Nobody's even talking about the patient is almost being seen as a specimen in this, in this equation. So we instead make, made a, an adherence diagnostic for the patient, and the way you use it is, um, this actually checks on the patient. We monitor by um, diagnosing their metabolites of the drug, and then we encrypt those that, that diagnostic in a, in, a, in a numerical format. And so um, the patient sends me a secret number that can only be revealed if they metabolize the medication. And then in return, I give them uh, cell phone minutes. And so it's, it's this loop of both monitoring and incentives. Um, and, and, and so this is something that, that we're rolling out in different places. We're looking at epidemiological uh, approaches for diagnostics so that, um, you know, when we look at maps like this, this one is for cholera. You could probably right now find a similar one for Ebola. Um, but unfortunately, we've, we paint these maps, beautiful illustrations, 
um, usually six months after everybody died. Um, and then we say, well, we're going to go and look at the data and the data set and you know, publish a paper and understand what happened in retrospect. To me, it's, it's, it's a climate science approach to health. It's not a weather system approach to health. So one of the things that we're doing is disseminating distributed diagnostics so that we can have almost like a four square version of health. So everybody in their first aid kit has a multiplex diagnostic that then can, they can just check in and then we can see swarms of the disease happening in real time. And we, we're, we're doing this for dengue and Ebola and other hemorrhagic fevers, but we're trying it out first, um, uh, the form factor with, with um, water systems. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in making health. Um, you know, I think domestically, we've done, we've done a really good job of exporting, um, you know, multi-layer hamburgers and things like that. And, and, in the, and certainly in the developing world and in America, there's been a, there, there's been a surge in, in obesity. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do in that regard. If you're interested in diagnostics, um, there's a lot of stuff that we can't do a good job at detecting that, that a lot of people can get involved in. We, we, we saw how simple it was yesterday to make paper diagnostics. And, and more people can, 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 can do this sort of stuff. Um, while we have advanced mechanisms for detecting and treating cancer here, we still have um, uh, big challenges, certainly in the developing world and in places like rural New Mexico, where we just, you know, telemedicine is still uh, um, a dream, um, how, how we can make better distributed diagnostics as for these things. Um, mental health is still one of those on, uh, you know, recently we, it's been on the news, but, but it's often usually out of sight, out of mind, and, and, and there's a lot of stuff that we can do in that regard. But, but DIY and making health has a huge capacity to, 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 to provide a lot of these long tail solutions. And while, you know, I sort of um, compare the progress of, of this resurgence of, of DIY medical technologies to um, when these guys were getting started, um, I, I think that, that, uh, that, that there's still a lot of promise. And if we start to move our, our mindset in the same way that, you know, I know classes haven't started, but I know a lot of parents right now are, you know, borrowing their son's or their daughter's car and doing all the things that they don't do, like rotate the tires and change the oil and, you know, check the fluid levels. Uh, we just, you know, we use our own hands to, to, to have this mentality of, of fixing and maintaining and improving. Um, our generation, I don't even own a car, uh, but I do go to my parents' house and I like, I, I uninstall Internet Explorer and I install Chrome and I do Firefox, right? And I, I, every time they clicked on all these like, oh my gosh, I have a virus, you know, now they have all this small. So I, I had this mentality of just going in and cleaning everything up. Uh, uh, but one of the things I challenge uh, people of all ages to do is like, what if we started to use that type of mentality when we go to our grandparents' house or, 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 or people that, that are sick and, and starting with a prescription bottle, what can we do for that? What, what can we make? What can we make in health that, that promotes that immediacy and that just-in-time fabrication um, so that we have it in our culture and it's not just this magical thing that we innovated. It's just something we do, just like cooking. Um, so I'll stop right there and if you have any questions. Uh, and these, this is my lab, so everything is possible because of these guys. So.